So to, um, to start with the presentation, just to give you an idea of the agenda, it will be me at the beginning talking about the European Right to Repair campaign, and then we will have two members that will present two interesting national policies that are happening at national level. Respectively, it's the French Reparability Index and the Repair Voucher, which is happening in Austria. Um, so to start about the European uh, Right to Repair campaign. The European Right to Repair campaign was launched in 2019 during FixFest in Berlin. And at the beginning, it was made of just five core steering group members who had already campaigned for, um, in favor of reparability. And during FixFest, it was the real launch of the campaign and that's where most members were, were recruited. Today, we are over 100 members uh, from 21 countries and we're trying to push EU institutions for, for right to repair. And uh, if you listened to the previous presentation that was done by Matthew, he was talking about his um, repair project um, that he's giving um, in uh, refugee camps in Uganda. We had someone online commenting that it's really unfair how anti-repair practices that uh, are pushed by companies to enable or to push people that do have a lot of resources and money to buy more and more and more they really suck for people that do not have resources and do not have money and do not have access um, to this obscene overconsumption either. So in a way, I really hope that our efforts as, as Right to Repair campaign in Europe will be able to also help uh, all the people that struggle with uh, short-lived devices all over the world, actually. I know it's a huge ambition, but <laughs> we try to be ambitious. So to give you an idea of the members of the campaign, because I know that some organizations that are attending FixFest are a bit interested in the campaign and maybe in joining the campaign, we are a very diverse uh, group of organizations. We have some environmental organizations. We have several charities that are uh, pushing reparability in different countries, such as Hundertisch Reparatur in Germany, uh, the Restart Project that you heard about before in the UK, and also Repair and Share in, in Belgium. Right, thanks. Um, we also have several companies, such as Back market, it's an online market of um, refurbished products, and iFixit, which is a company that sells spare parts and provides free um, wiki-like um, repair manuals. And yesterday it was brought to my attention that we're even more diverse than that, and we even have trade unions. So uh, we're, we're, we're a very diverse group of organization. Uh, the, the starting point is that everyone wants repair. Um, in Europe, we have uh, the possibility to measure that with the Eurobarometer, um, which is a survey that has shown again and again that a vast majority of people do want repair. So what's happening at EU level? In, on paper, lots of things are, are happening because repair is supposed to be part of the European plan to achieve circular economy by 2050, which is part of the bigger European Green Deal. But as we know, it's very, very often too little too late and um, not enough resources are put into the development of these policies and there is industry pushback. Um, so uh, one example that I like to talk about is the universal charger that was very celebrated as, as a great win for repair. Um, by autumn 2024, USB Type C will be the common the common charging port for all mobile phones, tablets, and cameras in the EU, and this was celebrated in the media and everywhere, and and, and rightfully so in a way. But is it such a big 
such a big win uh, if you think that the first memorandum of, of understanding about this was in 20, um, was in uh, 2009, so 13 years ago. We have been talking about this for 13 years. And for laptops, we will have to wait even, even more because it will not be 2024. We will have to wait for 40 additional months. This is an example that shows you that things are evolving very slowly and there is great industry pushback. So what do we actually want? What is the right to repair campaign advocating for? Three pillars mainly. Good design, fair access, and informed consumers. Um, when it comes to good design, anyone who has tried to repair something knows that it's very important that things are easy to disassemble, that they are even thought that it's possible to disassemble them and there are not security, hidden security screws there that things are not glued together or soldered together. And what, how we're trying to tackle this in EU legislation is basically with eco-design legislation, which is supposed to regulate many things, and among these also the reparability aspect of, of design. Um, eco-design uh, legislation is evolving, but it is evolving extremely slowly. And if you look at the scope, what, um, what products are currently covered, they, these are, these are, there are very little products that, that are covered. So this is, this is evolving very, very slowly and we have many, many examples of this. For instance, uh, this year we have been waiting uh, for the smartphones and, and tablets proposal for many, many months. It was delayed, delayed, delayed. And when it finally came out, um, the ambition of the, of the eco-design proposal for smartphone and tablets was really not up to scratch and not even aligned with uh, European climate targets. If you're interested in that, um, I have put up some apologies for, for the online Participants, I have put up some posters there where you can, it's their infographics, but you can also find them online, of course, on our website, our, our reaction to, to, this, um, to this proposal, for instance. The second pillar is fair access, which means in order for repair to become mainstream, we, everyone needs to have fair access to repair information and spare parts. And this is definitely not the case today. And what we can see at EU level is that EU legislation is evolving in this sense, but uh, it is also creating very differentiated categories of users that have different types of access to repair information and spare parts. For instance, if you are a professional repairer, it makes a difference whether you're authorized or not authorized by manufacturers. If you're an end user or a little bit of an, an informal repairer, you have less access to things. And we really don't think this makes any sense because we want repair to be mainstream and to be very accessible and we're trying to push for that. When it comes to informed consumer, informed consumers uh, on reparability, one very useful instrument could be the reparability index, which is something that we will talk about extensively because we have a speaker that will talk about the French reparability index that you might have heard of that is already in place in France. Uh, what's happening at EU level? This week, <laughs> me and my colleagues have been going a bit crazy because we were responding to the commission who has um, published a proposal for a uh, reparability index for smartphones and, and tablets. Are we happy about it? Mm. Very, very mixed feelings because we're happy that a reparability index is even uh, being discussed, but does it make sense to have a reparability index if we are not considering spare part prices as a criterion within the reparability index. We know that the price of repair is a very, very important factor in the decision whether consumers are going to repair their device or replace it. So we really, really need to take this into consideration and this is not the case today. Um, but we will hear more about that later. So I'm um, just going to give you a takeaway. Regulation at EU level is 
really too slow. It's evolving, but it's evolving too, too slow. And e-waste is growing very fast. As we know, it is anticipated to double by 2050, which is very, very problematic. And we would like to stress that when we talk about e-waste, we don't mean the discarded phones and tablets that we might have in our drawers. We mean especially the enormous amounts of waste that are produced during the manufacturing phase of, of these um, devices that the consumer don't see. So this is what we mean. Um, I will be around uh, all weekend, so if you have any questions about the Right to Repair campaign, feel very free to come to me. If you're interested in joining, if, you're, if you know of organizations that are interested in joining, um, I would be very, very happy to have a conversation. There are speakers over there in case you're interested. And we will now hear from Markus Piringa from Austria, who is going to tell us about repair vouchers that have been developed in Austria. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be here and to share some information and some insights about uh, the repair funding in Austria or the repair subsidy in Austria. Um, to start, um, maybe you know we have a, a national funding system now, but um, it is not the, the, before that, there have uh, been several federal states who already uh, implemented funding or subsidies uh, in Austria. This we, in Austria, we have all in all uh, nine federal states. So six of them have had a program before. Um, and also the city of Graz, which is, which is not a federal state, also had implemented a funding system. And they all stopped at... Uh, 2022 because a, a national uh, vulture system got in place. I will talk uh, a little bit about uh, three different systems because they are different in a way. Um, the first example is uh, one of a federal state. I would call it the first generation of, of repair funding. It is, I took uh, Upper Austria as an example because there is a little bit of data uh, how it worked. Um, so the system worked that um, repair of large and small household electrical appliances are funded um, up to 50% of the repair costs and up to a maximum of 100 euros of each repair. So uh, if your repair bill is 100 euro, you get 50 euro. If it's 200 euro, you get 100 euro. But if it's 500 euro, you also just get 100 euro. Um, the, must, the repair must be carried out by an authorized, authorized business licensed, uh, listed in the Upper Austrian Repair Guide. So we have, uh, in different, different federal states, we have repair guides. Um, there, to get into this repair guide, uh, it is checked if you have uh, the allowance or if you, are, um, uh, if you are allowed to repair the stuff you, which is fund funded. And in this model, the, repair, the, the customer in first place has to pay the full price of the bill and gets the funding afterwards. So uh, after having paid the price, uh, the customer has to submit a completed application form um, in the time of four weeks after the repair has been carried out to get the funding. And... Um, the information is uh, checked uh, by the authority and um, then after approval the customer gets the money back. So it is possible that not all criteria are met and in this case the customer doesn't get the money back. And this in, in Upper Austria it was about 9% of the cases that uh, the customers applied for the uh, money but they didn't get it because they didn't meet the criteria. Um, as I said in the beginning, there are some numbers. Uh, so there was a bachelor thesis on the Upper Austrian system. And so some of the found findings is that um, the average funding amount was uh, 96 euros. 40% um, of the customers stated that they would not have had the repair carried out without receiving the subsidy. So it really makes a difference 
So there are more repairs carried out. Even the next number indicates this, that 38% uh, uh, of the companies service, uh, surveyed noticed uh, an increase of the numbers of repairs, and uh, 42 noticed a slight increase. So the number of repairs went up. And the question is, what happens when the subsidies stop? In this case, uh, 26 of the companies uh, have noticed a drop of uh, repairs after the subsidies stop. So this indicates that it is a decrease afterwards, but uh, it makes a difference before and after because people are maybe, they were repaired for the first time and so they got into the mood of repairing more. Uh, this is just about uh, what kinds of uh, repairs have been carried out, what uh, appliances. So uh, the big blue one is smartphones, then coffee machines, 18%, washing machines, and dishwashers. So these were the, uh, the products which were repaired most often with the subsidy. The next example is an example of Vienna. Uh, this started in 2020. And in blue, there are the differences to the upper Austrian system. Um, so in, in Vienna, all kinds of devices were repaired, which uh, were covered by the re repair network in Vienna. Uh, the repair network, which I'm also coordinating, is uh, a platform of about 250 um, repair companies, and they repair almost everything. So also furniture, textiles, uh, whatsoever. And so the uh, Walcher system in Vienna was not only focused on electronic goods or ele electric devices. The same was that up to 50% of the costs were covered, and it's up to 100 euros. Uh, in the difference to the upper Austrian system, also uh, cost estimates were covered uh, up to uh, 45 euro because it's also a, a barrier for people to get things repaired, just to pay money, just to get to know if the thing is repairable or not. And so this was uh, in, the, in the Viennese system, also the cost estimates were covered. Um, and other, an, another difference is after the repair has been completed, a new repair vulture can be requested. And the other system in Upper Austria, it's just once uh, in a year that you can get the funding. And the repair must be carried out by an authorized business listened in the Repair Network Vienna. The Repair Network Vienna is a bit different to, to the... Um, repair guides we have in other uh, federal states because it also has uh, a quality management. Uh, and uh, I can talk about this more in the session tomorrow at two o'clock when, um, when we talk about repair networks. Um, so this was the first vulture system. The first in Upper Austria or in other uh, federal states was no vulture system because the person had to apply after already paying. And so in this case, uh, the repair shop had to sign a contract to the city of Vienna to be, to, to be able to receive the vultures. And the customer, for the customer it's easier because he just has to get the vulture, he goes to the repair shop and immediately, immediately when he pays uh, the costs, the vulture is subtracted. So he pays less money from the beginning. Um, and then uh, the, the business, the, the repair business, has to hand out or submit the vulture to uh, the authority and then gets the money from the authority. So the money goes not to the customer, the money goes to the repair business. And in Vienna it was possible to uh, uh, get the payment within two weeks, because this is a big thing. If this is a subsidy and uh, uh, um, the company has to wait long to get it back, uh, it's a problem for the liquidity, so that he can still pay his bills, because he's waiting for a lot of money. 
And here just also some, some numbers. Um, the average funding was close to the one in Upper Austria, it was 70 euros. And uh, the biggest part was the repair of mobile phones, computers, printers, etc. And the second was uh, electrical household appliances. And then we have also the non-electrical goods like bicycles, furniture, windows, interior design, uh, plumbing and electrical installations and other repair services such as shoes, textiles, bags, and so on. Um, now I switch to the Austrian wide repair bonus, uh, which started in April. It's a bit, it's very much based on the Viennese system. It's also a voucher system, but it has differences. Um, so it's only focused on the repair of electrical appliances again. Uh, so also e-bikes and so are covered, but for example, no uh, normal bikes without e-bikes because it's just electrical systems. It's again 50% of the costs which are funded, and this time it's up to a maximum of 200 euros. And the cost estimates are also covered, but only uh, up to 50% and up to 30 euro. And also uh, the same as the VNE system, a new voucher can be downloaded after the first uh, repair is completed. And also uh, the repair business must be listed, and this time uh, at the list of the national repair bonus. So uh, the, the big thing about the national um, voucher system is there is a lot of money in it. So we have 130 million euros, uh, which is out of the, it's EU money actually, it's uh, coming from the COVID uh, resurrection, I think, uh, fund it's called, recovery. Uh, the COVID, <laughs> COVID recovery fund. And up to date, so this is uh, the, the number of, uh, of from the 26th of April, um, 143,000 vouchers have been redeemed. And there are up to 2,500 companies taking part in the system. And 9 million euros were paid out. I think I skipped the next one because uh, it's also about um, how many uh, um, products are repaired. But it's also smartphones is a, is a very big issue in repairing. Uh, I didn't uh, make a slide about the um, conclusions. I just want to talk about them briefly. Um, so far as we have data, we can say uh, that a subsidy or a voucher system for repair is working, that you have more repair, and it's, a, it's overcoming the barrier of the price, because everybody knows as repair is quite expensive compared to new products, it's a big, it's a big barrier, and it's, uh, it's very a good method to lower this barrier. Um, also, what I heard from, from the repair companies I'm in contact with is that uh, the consumers tend to have higher quality repair. So if you have more expensive spare parts or less expensive spare parts, with the subsidy, uh, people tend to have a more quality, higher quality uh, repair. repair. Um, so it's a, it's a good tool to foster the repair of, uh, of after warranty repairs by professional businesses. And, um, but to really get into a repair society or a repair economy, we need a lot of measures. So then a lot of screws have to be driven. This is EU policy. Uh, this is uh, the cost factor, but it is also like uh, training and education. Uh, and so we also need a, lit, uh, a much informal education and therefore it's also very important to have initiatives like repair initiatives 
to and all together with all these tools together i think we can change the system thank you thank you very much marcus i think we were all eager to know more about the, about the Austrian system. I wonder whether at this stage um, there are already uh, some questions for, for, for the Austrian system. Um, I saw f f a few here. I wonder whether I should repeat them in the mic for, for the live streamers. So you mentioned that in order to qualify for the system, repairers had to demonstrate that they were competent to repair electrical goods. You did not mention that they had to also prove that they had liability insurance to do so. I'm asking this question because in the eco-design requirements for household appliances and also the ones upcoming for smartphones, there's a, a second requirement that a repairer should also demonstrate that they have liability insurance. So I was wondering if you could comment on that and if you find that a relevant requirement. Um, I have to admit that I'm not sure what uh, liabi liability sh insurance is, is, uh, is about. So the repairer has to demonstrate that he has uh, contracted insurance Con that would pay the customer in case any oh. damage would ensue from a faulty repair. Yeah, um, I, well, as far as I can say, I believe that uh, all the companies which have the, the legal permission to repair in Austria also have this kind of insurance because they are also listed at the Chamber of Commerce. Yes, thank you very much. Um, do you think there's an appetite to extend these vouchers to like self-repair kits? You know, this is a thing that manufacturers are now providing a lot more access to user repair, um, you know, We'd love to see that included, but do you think that do you think that the political there's mm. a political will for that uh, being included? So the question is if it is possible to expand it to to self repair. So there is then it 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 would have it it would uh, mean that it's uh, funding the spare part costs because you don't have costs of the of the repair as such. Um, it's, uh, I, it's for me, it's not easy to answer this question. Uh, I think it could be challenging to, um, to make sure that it is not misused because maybe I just buy a spare part and then I get the funding and then I resell the spare part again. So this would be quite challenging, I think. Thank you. Um, just to come back to your question, Thomas, before, because I, it's something I've heard when I was working at Reuse, um, that in Austria uh, there was this, um, an agreement between uh, insurance company and repair cafes there, so that they could uh, benefit from uh, liability insurance. And I wanted to know if you had more details on that, or at least just to, as a point of information, that there exist systems where it's possible for uh, for liability insurance uh, for repair cafes to benefit from liability insurance, and I think it was based on the fact that actually they are not commercial repairers, so the status is not really the same as for commercial repairers, where actually you need liability because you are uh, living out of uh, repairing stuff. But if you do that voluntarily, um, you shouldn't be required to to pay the same amount as a commercial a commercial repairer, which makes sense. Yeah. But um, if you have more details on that, that would be interesting. Um, yes, there is uh, insurance for repair cafes in Austria, and uh, so far it's for free. Um, as we know that there is very little damage really noticed from repair cafes. Uh, I don't know if it will stay this way. So this is just like a prototyping. It just uh, exists for one year, the insurance system. Um, if this is uh, possible because of this insurance to be part of a funding system or uh, to be part uh, of, a, of a national register or so, has to be discussed. I don't know.
Yeah, thank you. Um, I was curious about your process in setting the, the exact amount of the subsidy in the sense of you had these experiences in the city of Vienna and other cities. Uh, did, you, did you base, for example, this, this final amount of 200 euros and 50% of the price, did you base it on a certain research? How, how, how did you connect it eventually? And would you see a um, relationship between the prices you've set of the subsidy and the type of repairs which were eventually happening in terms of smartphones and this kind of thing? Um. I was not part of the process when the first subsidy started with the 100 euro. And then I think uh, people sorted out, okay, it's working with 100 euro. And that's what I believe. So I, I'm, I, I, I don't think that there is a like, scientific basis of the, of the account, of the, of the numbers. Yeah, I thought that's a very interesting question, whether that, that price guides the repair. Uh, I wonder about the risk of um, the system being um, abused. I saw in the early slide that nearly one in 10 got rejected. And I wonder if that was just they didn't do the process right or were there were suspicions that they were abusing it. And I got second part. It, I can imagine if 50% of a, some repairs are subsidized, somebody might double the charge of the repair, and yeah. is that a risk that happened, or how do you mitigate that? Yeah, uh, these are all good questions, uh, which I can't answer, uh, especially the ones uh, if the prices go up or so. Um, we probably have the data, we are collecting the data now, and it can be looked at, but so far, as, as the national system is just starting in April, uh, we don't have the evaluation data. Uh, but the data is here. Also, the data of the VNE system is here. Uh, so I think maybe in one or two years, we can answer a lot of those questions. Uh, the abuse is a problem, but um, as far as I can see, um, the Austrian government is very good looking at it because afterwards the EU will control the system. So as it's EU money, and I don't know if you ever had an EU project and you handed in the, uh, the, 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 your calculations in the, in the end or your, uh, yeah, uh, it's, they're really looking at it. And so Austria is really very looking at it that there is no mis, uh, misuse. But it's not easy. You have really, it's, uh, so the administration is, is re, it needs a lot of resources also from the administration. Also the, the, the first system, I mean, you have a funding of 100 euro and you need a person to really look of the receipts and if everything is, is correct. So it's a rather low amount of funding and a rather high um, um, administrative um, burden. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, I just had two questions. Uh, one about, uh, do you know if there's any kind of similar program being had, uh, rolled out in any other EU countries? And second question is about, uh, is there a, um, a requirement for a warranty or guarantee of repaired products after they've been repaired by the professional repairers? Uh, with the first question, as far as I know, in Germany, there's a federal state uh, who started with a, I don't know which one, do you know? Um, hmm? Thüringen. Thüringen. Ah, thank you. Yeah. So in Thüringen, in Germany, there's uh, a similar system has, has started. Uh, I don't know of any other region in, in Sweden. Okay. So uh, just for the one on who streams, they say that Munich and other cities in, in Germany also uh, start and uh, France is starting. Yeah, but it's so, so it hasn't started already. Okay. Yeah, discussions I think are going on in several countries, but uh, yeah, they didn't start so far. And the second part question was about uh, warrant, gu guarantees. Uh, 
it's just the same as every repair. So uh, I think there is a guarantee for one year if you, if you repair something for the repaired parts and for the repair. So if something else breaks from the same uh, product, it's not covered. But uh, as far as I know, it's, it's not different if it's funded or not. Okay, um, probably this is going to be the last question. Uh, I was wondering, you presented two uh, kind of different schemes, one that had more of an active role from the repairer and the other one from the consumer. And in terms of um, how widely adapted they were and how, or how efficient or uh, fluent in their um, kind of introduction, uh, which one would you consider to be um, kind of more reliable or better, <laughs> if that's... Um, it's a difficult question because I don't have the, really the data, so it's just a feeling. Um, from my, I mean, from my point of view, uh, for the consumer, for if if you want to have um, the best effect, it's a voucher system because it's much easier for the consumer. Uh, but the burden of the administration of the voucher system is more on the business also. So. Um, you have to have a really good administration so that the business doesn't have a bad effect because of this system. And um, yeah, I think it, it very much um, depends on how you design it. And uh, it's also um, also at the Vini system and at the, at the Austrian system, uh, you need in the first weeks and maybe in the first months, you are still learning. So it's, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you for all the questions. I see we have more questions, but I also really would like to hear from the French Repair Index. And I invite, encourage everyone to go and talk to Marcus uh, Piringa. They are both called Marcus, that's why I'm specifying the Austrian Marcus, because this conversation is super, super important. So over lunch, let's, let's talk more about, about these schemes. And let's now welcome Marcus Bergman, who is going to talk about the French Repairability Index. Yes. Hello, uh, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Markus Bergmann. Uh, I'm actually a PhD student, but I was uh, collaborating with HOP, a French association who's working against planned obsolescence. And together we uh, wrote a report uh, about the French Repairability Index. Actually, HOP was invited, but they couldn't make it today, so they asked me to be here. Um, okay, so I would like to uh, divide this presentation in two parts broadly. First, I would like to present the index itself, what is, it, what is it about, and then uh, talk a little bit about the findings of our report. So, uh, as you know, uh, there's a problem of supply and demand. Um, consumers don't really are able to distinguish between more and less repairable products, and also consume, um, manufacturers are not really yeah, committed to uh, produce eco-friendly products. Uh, so then the uh, story of the repairability index goes back to 2018, uh, where it was proposed as a measure in the roadmap for a circular economy. And uh, the idea was we had to create a mandatory display of simple information about how repairable a product is. And here, uh, this initiative is also only relating to electronic products. The idea then is to, yeah, at the same time, reorientate the consumer towards more repairable products, so to, to change the consumer behavior, and at the same time, yeah, to increase a little bit the pressure uh, towards the manufacturers. Uh, so this is what the repairability index looks like. Uh, it has to be displayed online and offline. It's a score from one to 10, 10 is the most repairable, and you also find a small color code next to it. 
Uh, it's part of the French law, which was introduced in uh, February 2020, and it stipulates that the producer, so the manufacturer of the product, has to calculate the, store, the score and then also transmit it to the seller. And the seller, on the other hand, has to display the score and also provide the details or the subcategories uh, of the index to the consumer if they ask about it. You can also see on the slide here the different product categories that are concerned. So there was a first rollout concerning five product categories, uh, lawnmowers, uh, smartphones, laptops, uh, dishwashers, and TVs. And then it was further extended to five other categories. A uh, little background information on how the uh, index was actually constructed. It was quite interesting because it is a mandatory index, meaning top-down approach, but at the same time, many different stakeholders were invited to create the methodology of the index, how to calculate it. Uh, among others, uh, iFixit was there. Uh, hello again, Thomas. And uh, manufacturers were invited, NGOs, retailers, uh, many, many different uh, stakeholders from the repair sector. Um, this was very important uh, for many reasons that we will talk about later. So what is uh, the index actually? Uh, let's take a zoom in. There are different uh, criteria, five criteria uh, that you can see on the left side of the slide. Uh, so the first criterion is the repair information. Yeah? Do I have the manual which shows how I can disassemble and reassemble uh, my product, for instance? Is the product easy or difficult uh, to disassemble? Do we have the spare parts, the price of the spare parts, and then a fifth uh, criterion, which is product specific. So for instance, uh, this is an example of the smartphone index, and there we have also software-related issues. Interesting to know about the indexes that there are different repair routes considered. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, you can repair a device either yourself, you can go to your manufacturer, uh, you can go to a professional authorized repairer or an independent repairer. All those different repair routes were considered to a certain extent in the index. And this is also thanks to this multi-stakeholder approach you can imagine that if there were only uh, manufacturers sitting on the table, we wouldn't have the uh, um, self-repair column, for instance. Uh, as it is a mandatory index, uh, there, are, there are also sanctions, meaning that uh, there will be official constro uh, controls starting in 2022. Uh, the index was introduced in 21, so the first year was kind of a transition giving more time to the manufacturers. So let me come to the second part, to the uh, actual report that I wrote with Hop together. What is it that we wanted to do? We wanted to uh, look at the overall deployment of the uh, index after 11 or 12 months. We wanted to look at the consumers. Do they understand what the index is about? Uh, do they use it? Is it useful for them? And also, we wanted to look into detail into some uh, scores that have been calculated and displayed by the manufacturers to look at uh, are they complying with all the instructions or maybe abusing. Uh, how did we do it? We um, collected all about 2,000 indices and made some statistical analysis. We uh, did an online survey uh, in interrogating over 1,200 potential consumers. We interviewed people from the repair sector, and then uh, we collaborated with FNAC Darty to actually take some products, disassemble them, et cetera, and calculate the score by ourselves. So here are the results for the first part, the statistical analysis. Two points that I want to make clear. You can see here the scores available on the market after 11 months, more or less, for each of the five categories. Uh, you can see that there are not many scores below five, and you can see that the distribution of the scores are not um, yeah, homogenic. They were a little bit skewed to the right, a little bit skewed towards better scores. This raises a couple of questions. Um, was the index correct, correct the uh, 
co constructed, where the power balances equal in the construction, uh, is the index imp uh, um, improvable, and most importantly, is the index discriminatory of different scores. You can imagine if there are only uh, good scores on the market, consumers can still not distinguish between more and less repairable products. Uh, some key figures from the online survey with the potential consumers. Three points that I want to highlight. So the index is well known by the French population. They know what it's about, why we have uh, the need for a repairable index. Then if you insist a little bit on the different criteria, how the index is actually composed, there are still uh, some learning gaps. The, th the second thing is that um, yeah, co people that actually bought a new uh, product that was concerned by the index didn't really see it oftentimes in 2021. Uh, so it wasn't that the index became mandatory in January 2021 and then already all products had an index. Only 28% of the consumers who were buying a product actually saw the index, either online or in the, in the, in the store. Nevertheless, a good thing to mention is that if they bought and saw the index, then it was useful for them. Uh, over three uh, fourth, over 35% actually said it was useful to uh, make their purchase decision. Uh, last part of our uh, report was then to zoom into certain scores. We uh, looked into six different product scores, uh, smartphones um, and some TVs, for instance. These are the findings to sum them up. From six products that we um, counter expertized, we found lower scores for five out of six products. Uh, only for one product, this was the uh, Acer laptop, we found basically the same score. The other scores were too high, according to us. The conclusion for us was official controls are necessary and uh, we, we, we esteem that some of the manufacturers overestimated the repairability of their, of their products. Um, last important finding was also during this report that there is a certain weakness, uh, according to us, according to HOP, um, of the index, which is the compensation effect, what we call it. What do I mean by that? Well, you can find a product with a very good score, an overall score of 7.3, for instance, here in the example, you will get a, a green logo. So consumer instantly thinks everybody, everything is fine, I can repair my product. But in certain key uh, criteria, such as, for instance, the availability of spare parts, you have a very, very low score. In reality, what is going to happen? Yeah, you can have access to the manual. Uh, maybe the spare parts are also not very expensive, but they are not available. So in the end, uh, it's not repairable. So Hop and uh, yeah, myself in the, in, the, in the report, we proposed some measures to address this problem. Key takeaways uh, from the repairability things in France for us are the repairability index is a very good initiative to foster repair, both on the national but also on the supranational level. Uh, I think for the repair score on the European level, for instance, this was a very important driver to accelerate the process. It was also important to show it is possible to measure repairability, which is not so straightforward as it sounds. Uh, and it's a very good initiative, uh, which is welcomed by the consumers. Nevertheless, uh, there are improvement points for the index. Uh, for instance, there are transparency issues. What do I mean by that? Um, there are no, there's not one place where you can go to and find all the repairability scores. And you can imagine that when you buy a product, maybe one, two, three years later, there is a breakdown. You do not instantly find the repair score. So how do you want to hold responsible uh, consumer afterwards? This is a problem. Also the detail of information that you have access to as a consumer can be improved according to the report. Uh, for instance, 
the uh, manufacturer has to make a commitment in the repairability index for each spare part. For each spare part, for instance, they say, okay, this one will be available for seven years. This kind of detail of information you don't see as a consumer, which is also a problem if you want to hold them uh, responsible afterwards. Uh, another point that can be improved is, as I said, the, um, the overall calculation of the final score to address this compensation effect, for instance. And um, in our um, interviews with people from the repair sector, we also learned that there are other repair barriers that are not addressed so far in the, in the index, for instance, software issues such as the serialization of spare parts. Uh, and yeah, the thing that I already said is controls, official controls are actually key for this repairable index to commit uh, manufacturers and make sure that they are not abusing the initiative. So this was a brief overview of the French Repairable Index. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Before we um, open the floor for questions, we just wanted to give a quick information that we will have more sessions on repairability indexes during Fixed Fest. Thomas knows where and when. Yeah, so there will be a, a primarily Dutch speaking session, um, which will be the before last session tonight in the Hammer Room. So it will be primarily Dutch, but also open to English or French. And there will be a primarily French session tomorrow, um, tomorrow morning, uh, but also open to Dutch and English if you want. These, section, these sessions will be a little bit more interactive, so our idea is that you as a repairer or activist can share any frustrations you have, any barriers, any problems that you encounter, and then we will reply by explaining to you whether this is dealt with in any political projects or whether there's a policy tool addressing it, whether something is underway, and if nothing is underway, how that is, so that we sort of start from your concerns and explain what policy is doing uh, on that level. Now to the questions for Marcus. I already see one here. Thank you. Uh, just had a question concerning the level of uh, awareness of uh, consumers. When they, so you said that when they buy the, these products, uh, only 27%, I think you said, uh, are, um, are aware that there is uh, this, um, this logo. What, what, what do you think is the reason why they can't see it? Like, is it too small? Uh, it's the way it's displayed, or maybe they just don't care and they'll just get the price. What, what are the, the reasons you think they, uh, they just ignore the, <laughs> the majority, just ignore the, the, la the label? Mm. So 28% um, of those who bought a product in 2021 only saw the index. This was also due to the uh, recent introduction of the initiative. So, and because there were no official controls. Meaning, uh, even though the index was mandatory, uh, there were no sanctions if manufacturers didn't display it. So this is the first main reason, because there were so many products on the market without an index. As to the visibility of the score itself, it is well described in the French law how it has to be displayed. Next to the price, uh, I showed you a picture here. So it has to be... The, the final score has to be has the same size of the price next to the price with the colored logo. So I think the visibility is there in the, in the store and also online. Then if you want to look into further details into the subcategories, if you want to know, uh, do I have the manual available? Do I have the spare parts? That gets a little bit more tricky. There you have to, they have different ways, uh, leeway for the manufacturers to display this kind of information. And some ways, uh, options that the manufacturers chose are more easily accessible than others. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious about what the, about the, the 27 interviews or for something, the number of interviews that you did. Uh, what did, uh, in terms of repairers, what was the repairers' uh, impression of the score and did it 
what did they feel it was reflective of the actual repairability score and did it actually affect the number of devices being repaired? Um, were people more likely to have a device repaired if they see, after they've bought it and it breaks and they see the score, did this affect the way the, they chose to repair or not? Yeah, so uh, I think the repairers, they have a very uh, specific position uh, as to the French repairability index. Why is this so? For first of all, I think they are happy that the index exists because uh, it raises awareness of re the repair sector itself. It can motivate uh, people to repair more devices and accelerate their, their business um, in one way. On the other hand, um, and also they were also invited, they were part of the stakeholders uh, constructing the index itself, so they were very happy to be be part of this process and contribute the expertise, which was also very important uh, regarding the, the statistics, for instance, that they could uh, share with the public authorities, uh, which go beyond the warranty period. Otherwise, we would have had a lot of statistics, but only within the warranty period, and things change afterwards. On the other hand, um, repairers will face situations where there will be a customer with a high repairability index, and due to the compensation effect, in reality, the index might not, the device might not be repairable. Uh, so then the consumer might reproach uh, this to the repairer itself. Maybe he thinks it's due to his skills or network or whatever. So the relationship is not th that straightforward for repairers and the index itself, I would say. Yeah, a following question. Um, you said that companies are uh, supposed to do a self-declaration, right, about the index, and then the authorities kind of revise and approve or decline what they declare. Um, but then are they kind of, do they have a penalty if they just like overestimate uh, the repairability of their devices? Like uh, in the research that you did and you had these differences, is there some way to actually um, kind of, I don't know, uh, appeal uh, them and... Yeah, yeah, um, I showed it on the slide. I, I didn't mention it uh, to be brief, that there are penalties, sanctions uh, in the law foreseen up to 15,000 euros per model. Uh, these are the, the sanctions in law specifically uh, to the repairability initiative. Then there you have other laws that could be applied, other penalties, uh, more general related to misleading commercial behavior. And there the penalties are much higher. Um, nevertheless, one thing to keep in mind is that public authorities have limited resources. We will have to see in what kind of way they will conduct these controls. Are they only looking at, is the uh, index present or not? Or are they actually going to recalculate the score and look into it, how it was uh, actually, are, are, are the scores reliable or not? So this has to be seen. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have a question about the relationship between the price and the index for the consumer like decision making when they buy a product. I am curious if it does increase the sales at the end, like the consumer aware that this one can be repaired, do they, they really adopt the product to, to be used at their home? Yeah, does it increase the sale? So is the price affected by the index? Is this the question? Yeah, my question is actually, does the in, like, I'm just thinking like consumer price of point of view, if you want to buy a product, maybe price is also a very important decision criteria. And yeah. when they see the index, how, how that like play between these two, do they at the end decide on price more than the index or is it okay. yeah, how, how you affect the decision making? Do you see any effect on that? So if I understand the question well, if, if I'm a consumer and I have to make a decision, do I consider more the price or more the repairability index? Well, we did a, a small experiment uh, about the uh, intention to purchase uh, devices. And we tried to include this decision. Uh, we, for instance, uh, showed a high price with a high index, low price, low index, and 
some variations of that. And our findings were that price plays a role, but it can be um, medi mediated by a higher score. So if you have a higher score, consumers are potentially more uh, willing to pay a more expensive product. But this was uh, an experiment about the intentions to buy. Another story might be actually doing or observing the actual behavior of consumers. Um, my question has um, largely been asked already by this lady here, um, but I wanted to ask more specifically about um, the validation of the score and uh, is, the, is the cost of undertaking the validation uh, paid by the business or is that paid by the government? So validation, you mean uh, the, the official controls? Yeah, the official controls. Do they pay for the validation when they submit the device to be sold in the market? No, so so the, the index is self-declared, is calculated by the manufacturer, mm -hmm. submitted to the seller, the seller displays it. Okay. The, in this process, there will occur some costs. It depends on the experience uh, of, the, of each player, but there's an estimation of 1,000 euros per model, okay? These costs uh, are to be borne by the seller and by the manufacturer itself. Then there are official controls, and the official controls are conducted by uh, public authorities, and public authorities will pay for these, this process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for the presentation. I had um, two small questions. The first one was about the um, level of handymanship. Um, is there, within uh, the definition of the index, is there any reference or dimension concerning the, the ability of the repair person? Is it uh, for DIYers or is it more for professional repairs? And is this, if not, is this considered in maybe future versions or are you putting this in your work? And the second one was about uh, the assessment of durability. So sometimes products may be more durable, uh, but less repairable. Uh, how, how, how does that play in your assessments? Yeah, very good questions. Uh, the first one as to the skills of the people repairing. As I mentioned, there are different columns, different players, uh, stakeholders considered in the index. So you have a, if, for instance, you have spare parts available for in-house manufacturers, uh, after sales services, these people are usually uh, skilled, they are employed because of their skills. Uh, you have also considered another, in another column, repairers. Repairers include both authorized, so prof professional repairers, but also independent ones. Huh? And then you have another column for self-repair uh, self for the consumers itself. Um, so you have different levels of skills considered in the index, but it's not that to get a high score, you need more skills or anything like that. Yeah? And the second part of the, uh, the second question regarding the durability and how to measure that. This is an on ongoing work in France. The French Repairability Index will transform into a durability index in 2024. It will integrate further dimensions. Repairability is one of them. Two others, uh, upgradability and the reliability. So how often do uh, breakdowns occur? And uh, up updatability is can I extend the functions of the device either via software or material extensions. But as to how exactly this is going to be measured, I don't know yet because it's not, uh, it hasn't been decided yet. Uh, I would just like to add one comment to, to that question um, because you mentioned specifically skills and I think it's fair to say that the index at this point considers um, the support that is extended to certain types of repairs but it does not actually consider the skills which was your question I think. More specifically it addresses the design and the ease of disassembly only by the number of steps. 
So the score is determined by the number of steps required to change a certain component, but it does not evaluate the difficulty of any of these steps, which I think relates to your question. So if the index were further developed to better take into account, in, into account skills, there would have to be a differentiation in scores, whether, for instance, you have to desolder a component or you just unscrew it or you snap it. But this is not in place at this point. Um, I think yesterday there was brief mention of um, effects of the policy in terms of reaction of the companies, as in publishing repair manuals in order to get a higher score. And I was just wondering if you have any more examples of um, companies anticipating legislative change and adapting their products, or um, if, the, if you expect these kind of reactions from companies, or yeah, what the situation is with that. So, um, as I said, in this construction process of the index, many, many different stakeholders were involved, and be among them also manufacturers. So, this shows that the index is affecting them uh, in one way or another. They are interested in the initiative for lobbying reasons or also for learning reasons, right? As to the impact of the index itself, it's a little bit early, I would say, to evaluate this. Nevertheless, some first indications are there. For instance, yeah, you mentioned the availability of manuals. And we have seen that, uh, for instance, among very big uh, manufacturers, key players, that this has improved for certain product categories such as smartphones. Uh, the index is also well communicated uh, by those uh, manufacturers on their websites. Dedicated websites have been created. Um, access has been made very easy for the consumers. But uh, for instance, as to this design, I think this will take uh, a little bit more time to to evaluate, actually. Um, my question concerns more the policy side or the campaigning side of um, this uh, project. Um, so now we're installing the national score in Belgium also gradually. Um, we'll have the French example. We'll have other countries following uh, this example. I'm expecting there is a little bit of difference between these legislations. And I'm also wondering um, how this will interfere with the European initiative. So will we get different type of scores or how, how will they integrate? Hmm. This is one of the key questions for the manufacturers, always ask at every uh, stakeholder meeting. Um, general rule is that if there's something on a European level, this will supersede the national level. So if there is a repair score at the European level for smartphones, then there will be no more score on the national level. French reparability score for smartphones will soon uh, disappear. Nevertheless, there is uh, a durability score to be displayed in 2024 in France. The durability score contains the reparability score. Now is the question which reparability score will be contained, the European one or the French one? If so, is it be displayed in one final score or in two different scores? These are questions that are not answered so far. Yeah, to this point, maybe just a point of frustration from the European Right to Repair campaign. When we see uh, industry pushback, it's a bit, at the EU level, it's a bit ridiculous because on one side they're going, they're complaining that the repairability indexes are going to be different in every country, but then they're making the EU index very, very weak. So it's, um, it's, it's a challenge and it would, of course, it would make more sense to have a reparability index that is more or less uniform, but then it needs to be strong and it cannot be the weaky thingy that was proposed for smartphone and tablets, I would say. Um, any more questions? I think people are getting hungry. Maybe the last, the last word. Do manufacturers uh, get training in how to analyze repairability? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Do, do manufacturers get a, a training in how to implement the, the, the index and um, analyze their products? 
there, there, there are no official workshops uh, from the public authorities. Nevertheless, there are workshops from independent private uh, actors. So if you want, you can participate in something like that, but you have to pay for it. The index will be presented. It will be shown how to calculate it, some step forward, OK? Um, but then for everybody for free, there are also manual, an official manual explaining more in detail how to calculate each score. Very extensive manual. Um, public authorities are also available, uh, make themselves available for all the manufacturers, retailers that have questions. Exchanges are quite intense. So if you have questions as, as an actor, you can reach out to different stakeholders. Then I would say thank you very much for um, you. both Marcus's <laughs> and the participants. Um, if you have any more questions, because these are key topics, uh, so anything about the right paper campaign, um, you know where to find me. I know that the Austrian Marcus will stay on for the rest of FixFest for the Austrian vouchers. And with regards to the other Marcus, will you stay on a little bit? Okay, so you, we have until tonight to uh, go to him and ask him plenty of questions about the French Repair Index. Thank you very much for, for joining us, and I think we have to go get lunch before it's gone. <laughs> Thank you.